السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لساجدين قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا إن الشيطان للإنسان عدو مبين وكذلك يجتبيك ربك ويعلمك من تأويل الأحاديث ويتم نعمته عليك وعلى آل يعقوب كما أتمها على أبويك من قبل إبراهيم وإسحاق إن ربك عليم حكيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah is dedicated to a couple of ayat that belong to Surah Yusuf and they are particularly involving wisdom that comes from the tongue of Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam has a unique place in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal will describe him on a number of occasions and one of the things that is common in all of those occasions is Ya'qub alayhi salam's role as a father. He is, when, when the Qur'an talks about fatherhood in many places, somehow or the other, Ya'qub alayhi salam gets mentioned. And so it's important to note some of that sunnah of his that Allah Azza wa Jal made timeless. And of course, the, one of the most beautiful places that Allah describes or encapsulates some of that wisdom is in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. I feel that this is important because in our day and age, education has become of a, something that it wasn't ever before. People receive an education in the sciences, people become very educated in medicine, people can become educated in technology and other things and they remain very minimally educated in what it means to be a father or what it means to be a son or what it means to be a neighbor or what it means to be a good friend or we don't have that basic education anymore and so you find this strange irony you have people that have a PhD or a doctorate they're very well educated but they don't know what it means to be a good son or they don't know what it means to be a decent parent etc right so there's a there are two different kinds of education these education, the kind of education that will give you, get you a good job uh, or will further you in your career is not necessarily the kind of education that will make you a better human being. Those are not the same thing. And this is part of the education of the Qur'an is what makes you a better human being, what makes me a better human being. What I want to get straight into is how Allah Azza wa Jal introduces this remarkable episode in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. Of course, Surah Yusuf is its, in its entirety dedicated to the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. The first thing I'd like you to note is that the story of Yusuf alayhi salam in the Qur'an is not even one-third or one-fourth of what is found in the Bible. The Bible is four times longer when it describes the story of Joseph. And the Qur'an is extremely brief when it describes this, the same exact story. Why is that the case? Allah Azza wa Jal clearly is not going to tell us everything about the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. Unlike Musa alayhi salam, we learn about his story from the, fact, from the time when he was a little baby, when he couldn't even speak yet, all the way through. With Yusuf alayhi salam, we begin when he's already a young boy, right? So there's still quite a bit of his life missing in the Qur'an's narrative. Similarly, we don't get a lot of details. Allah doesn't tell us what are the names of his brothers. Qur'an will not mention. Quran will not mention even the name of, even not even mention his mother directly. Quran will not mention the name of the minister who eventually took him in, or the name of the wife of the minister who's such a central character in the story. None of these people are mentioned by name, locations mentioned exactly. It's not the case, other than Misr in a passing reference. The reason for that is Allah Azza wa Jal is not concerned with information. That's not what's important for you and me. What is important for you and me are lessons that will guide my life and your life. So he will tell us the information that is relevant, enough for us to get the guidance. This is not a book of history, it's not a book of facts, it's a book of counsel, it's a book of maw'idah, it's a book of huda. 
It's a book of counsel and guidance. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla has changed and, and very selectively picked small episodes from the amazing life of Yusuf alayhi salam. And every little detail that he's going to tell us in this surah is extremely important because he skipped a lot of other things and only mentioned these things. So whatever he did pick is of extreme value. Nothing can be overlooked. And so when we begin this story, the first thing that catches our attention is Allah Azza wa Jal says right before this ayah, "Wa in kunta min qablihi la min al He tells Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "We're going to tell you the best of all stories. I'm sure you've heard that before. We're going to tell you the best of all stories. But you used to be unaware before this, not just unaware of the story." But the, the, the lessons that are going to be inside this story, the wisdom that's going to come from this story, is something that even the Prophet ﷺ was not taught before this. It is going to be unique. So don't just reduce that, yes, Rasulullah ﷺ did not know the story of Yusuf ﷺ, and that's what's being said. Actually, a lot more is being said. There are things inside of this story that without the story, we would have never known that Allah Azza wa deems important for you and me in our lives. And so where do we begin? Allah Azza wa Jal describes this young child, Yusuf alayhi salam, إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ When Yusuf alayhi salam said to his father, and he's a young boy, we don't know the exact age, but you imagine anything between 8 and 12 years old, he's a young child. And he's, he comes up to his father, maybe even younger, and what does he say to him? يَا أَبَتِ إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا Dad, and first of all, Ya Abati, Dad, and the Arabic word for father is Abi. Ya Abi, my father. Ya Abati, Atta Tushir ila al Hub, wal Karam. So it's it's actually my respected father and my my beloved father. It says don't. And we don't talk like that. Your kids don't come up to you and say, "Beloved father, can I have some chocolate?" They don't. They don't talk to you like that. That's not how we speak anymore. But the equivalent of we of it would be, Dad, I love you. Dad, give me a hug. I want to tell you something. It's a loving expression of addressing your father. It's not just dad or papa or baba, but it's actually dad along with an expression of love. That's the first thing we learn about this child, is that he expresses love for his dad. And the second thing we're going to learn here is that he came up to him and said, inni. Inni means no doubt I. Now the word inna is used, they say in Arabic, لِإِزَالَةِ shak to, to remove doubt. So when you're about to say something that the listener will not believe easily. It sounds so unbelievable, they might not believe you. That they don't think you're serious. So the Arabs use the device inna to remove that doubt. No, no, I really mean what I'm going to say. It is as though the child recognizes that what he's about to say is not easy to believe. It's this amazing thing, this crazy thing that he saw. And he's going to tell his dad all about it, but he's thinking, dad might not believe me. And so he says, no, really, dad, I really did see this. Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkabat. I really did see, in fact, 11 stars. The sun and the moon, was shamsa wal qamar. And it's incredible that the sentence starts over again. And it's, it captures really the, the reluctance of a child. I mean, I have a lot of children. Alhamdulillah, I have seven children. And the, th the thing with children is that when they want to tell you something that's exciting or something that happened, they repeat themselves a lot. And they can't even get to the end of a sentence. So a kid will, something happened on the playground, my son comes running up to me when he's little, he says, Abba, Abba, you know what happened? At the slide, at the slide, um, at the slide. I'm like, what happened at the slide? I forgot. <laughs> you know? A child will actually become nervous and repeat themselves. Yusuf السلام, as a child comes up to his father and says, you know what really happened dad? I saw 11 stars, the sun, even the moon. But what did you, there's more, but he's nervous. And he stops and he starts over again and the verb is repeated. I saw them doing sajda to me. The verb I saw is repeated twice. It's not mentioned once. Literally like a child saying, I saw it, I really saw it. Like, it's so beautiful and so natural, the way in which he speaks to his dad. The first thing that I'd like to highlight here, is that this boy saw a dream. Who did he run and talk to? His father. Our boys have a feeling, have a, have a dream. Forget about a dream. They, even something happens to them in reality. 
who do they go and run and talk to? And when they want to come and talk to you, dad, you're watching the news. You're doing something on your phone. I would say, oh, but you know what happened today at school? Da, 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 da. And, then, and then on the playground, and you're like, uh-huh, go tell your mother. And you know, you do that enough times, and you'll notice your son doesn't come up and tell you. Who does he go straight to? He goes straight to mom. The natural inclination, by the way, children gravitate towards their mother. They do. But we're learning something about Yaqub salam that hasn't even been said. He is the kind of father that has created such a nurturing environment for this child that this child experienced something not even when he was awake, he experienced something when it was a dream and he can run over to dad and give him a hug and tell him all about it because he knows dad is going to listen. Dad's going to pay attention. He's not going to ignore what I'm saying. And if anything, you know, for children, things that are important to children are not the same as things that are important to adults. When you're, my kid is playing with a bunch of Legos and one of the pieces is missing, his world has come to an end. Abba, I can't find the hat. And that's a really big deal to him. Now, it's not a big deal to me, but you know what? It has to become a big deal to me because it's important to him. A dream may not be important to you or me, but it's important to this child. It's valuable to him. So he runs over and tells his dad, and his dad doesn't say, what did you eat for dinner last night, boy? You know, it's just a dream. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. I get those all the time. He doesn't do that. He actually carefully, attentively listens to his son. We're learning something incredible about fatherhood that we did not know before. Quran didn't highlight this anywhere else. It highlights something about how loving a father needs to be to young children, to very young children, to nurture them, to engage them, to be a good listener to them, to sit and just listen to your child. Even if they're babbling and talking about absolutely nothing that makes any sense to you, you still listen attentively as though you're a learner. And your child is, you know, my, my girls, they talk a lot because they're girls. So, but, you know, they, they talk and they talk and they talk and they're telling me about this kid and this, this other girl at school who became friends with them and she's not friends with them anymore and this one and that one. And there's so many names. It's like an entire, like, Ilmul Nisa almost. Like, Ilmul Rajal al Hadith. There's all these names you have to know and characters and I have to keep up. I can't just be driving the car and saying, uh huh, mm hmm, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because <laughs> that's what we do. We don't really listen. The father is actually attentively listening. And how will you know, how will I know that you and I are trying to live up to the sunnah of Yaqub salam as immortalized in the Quran when we notice that our children on their own come up and talk to us? Because today, we try to talk to our kids and say, how was school? Eh, it, was, it was okay. What did you do? Things... Who are your friends? Some people? They don't talk to us. But that's not because they're bad kids. It's because we didn't open that door enough, wide open enough. We didn't become their friends first. Children need to be approached and, and made, feel, made to feel welcome. You know, in many societies, especially in Muslim societies, the father is supposed to be an authority. When, when Baba walks into the house, everybody's like, Judgment day has begun, you know. Everybody starts, stops, you know, even people were happy right before and they noticed the car pull up. <gasps> Baba's here. And there's just, you know, military attention style, happiness has left the home. You better watch every, because he gets angry so easily. You don't want to make Baba angry, he had a long day at work. You don't want to say anything because he'll get really upset. This is the legacy of Yaqub alayhi salam. If that was the kind of father he was, would Yusuf salam ever come up to him and even tell him anything? This story would never have even begun. None of this would have happened if he wasn't a kind of loving, nurturing father. That's the prerequisite of the first ayah. And then this child comes and tells him this fascinating dream. And what is inside this dream is just remarkable. The language of the Qur'an, it's so remarkable. On the one hand, the child is reluctant. And he knows that he's not going to be believed. And I told you he used the word inni. And if you eventually, by the end of the surah, we understand that the 11 stars were actually his siblings. And the sun and the moon represent his parents. 
And we also know that the, by the end of this dream, or by the end of getting to this sentence, what he tells his father is that he's going to be doing, they're going to be doing sajda because of him. They're going to be falling into sajda because of him. Which is an extremely humble position for someone to be in. And if you imagine somebody falling into sajda because of somebody else, you would imagine that the person, the masjudun lahu, the person to whom sajda is being done, or because of whom the sajda is being done, is a very important person. So now this child sees a dream in which he is a very important person. But actually, what's, what's even more incredible is it seems from the language of the ayah that this young boy is a genius and Allah Azza wa Jalla has inspired him in a very special way that he already has the understanding of what the dream means. He didn't come to ask his father, what does this mean? It seems he already knows what it means. This is why he gets to 11 stars, the sun and the moon, mom and dad, and when he gets to that point, he can't even finish because how can I imagine my mom and my dad humbled in front of me? How can I even imagine that? And then on top of that, those of you that are familiar with the Arabic language, it's, these are these are غَيْرْ ذَبِلْ aqul. You have the sun, the moon, the stars. These are, you know, not living things. And the Arabic pronouns for non-living things are either the, the, the feminine pronoun, ha, or if you want to do tafkhim and make a big deal out of them, hunna. So the Arabic, what if the expected Arabic was going to be, رَأَيْتُ هُنَّ li sajidat Or, رَأَيْتُ هَا li sajida. That's the expected Arabic. But the Qur'an says, رَأَيْتُ هُمْ li sajideen, Which is used only for people. He actually used the pronoun, when he says, I saw them doing sajda because of me. The word them is actually only used for living people, for, for, for human beings. And so he used a word that already suggests that he, I know that it's people, it's not the stars and the sun and the moon. That's the genius of this boy. But it's such a small thing and the father hears it and picks up on it. This kid is special. He's not just special because he saw a dream. He's really special because he figured it out too. He even figured it out. And he recognized all of that from one sentence. Our children have been given lots of gifts. And their gifts, you will discover them by engaging them in conversation. Every child is given a unique set of gifts. Some of your kids are very artistic. Some of your kids are very mathematical. Some of your kids are very analytical. Some of your kids have an incredible memory. They're not all the same. When you engage them in conversation, you're actually discovering what they are hiding inside of them. And you won't know anything about those hidden talents and those hidden gifts Allah has given them until you and I become good listeners. The father becomes a good listener and picks up on the fact that this child is not a normal child. He's special. It's not just so special to see a dream, but to be able to, to figure that out too. And he knows now immediately that it's people and 11 stars and it's people, it's 11 brothers. Oh, sun and moon, that's the parent. And now he's actually told his father the interpretation. In, in one sentence, the dream and the interpretation. And the father, first thing he does, First thing he does, it's so amazing. And th this was the first wisdom I wanted to tell you, open communication between father and son. The second thing that I want to share with you, Ya bunayya la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika. My beloved little boy, my, my dear little son, that's how he addresses him, Ibni is my son. Ya bunayya ism tasgheer, my little boy. My little, it's also an expression of love. So the, the child spoke to him lovingly, and the father also responded lovingly. If you, you, we have to reciprocate love. We have to reciprocate loving expressions to our kids. We have to let them know how much we love them. You cannot say, my dad never hugged me, so we don't, we don't do that in our family. You don't do that to children. That is not the sunnah of our prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam. You know? It's, it's unfortunate that some people think that the only kind of father they need to be is an authority. And they don't reciprocate, I need my children to respect me. They know I love them. No, they don't. They don't know that you love them. Ask those kids, I think Baba hates me. They'll tell you. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> you need to express the fact that you love them. 
You need to demonstrate the fact that you love them. And then he says, don't tell this to your brothers. What you've seen, don't tell it. The first thing dad says is don't tell this to your brothers. His brothers are older than him or younger than him. The vast majority of them are older than him. And he looks up to his brothers. And just like he's excited about what just happened, just like he told dad, he's also, he might even tell his brothers. Now we know later on his brothers are no good. And they're going to scheme against him and all of it. But the first thing you tell your child is sometimes the family situation is complicated. You know, your family is not the only one that has problems. Prophets had families with problems. He's got sons that are out of control. And he's a great father. We already know that. We already learned that he's done his job as a good dad. And if he did this with Yusuf, then I can guarantee you he was the same way with all of his other sons. Isn't that the case? It's not like he raised those kids as a tyrant or as an oppressive father. And then all of a sudden he became a good father to Yusuf. It's not the case. Our anbiya, they are models of justice and fairness. So he did his job as a father, but those kids did not turn out like Yusuf. They, they came out very different. A lot of us invest into our children. Some of you have white hair on your beards because your children are no longer children, they're adults themselves. And you did everything you could to give them love and nurturing and an education of the deen and to give them upright character, and they went in a different direction later on in life. They are no longer the kids you expected them to be. They are far away from Allah's deen. They're rebellious, they're not respectful, and you're thinking, what did I do wrong? I did everything that I could and they turned out this way? How can I bring them back? So many desperate mothers and fathers, mostly mothers, come up to me and tell me, I did everything for my child. I provided them a good education, I gave them good environment. I, I, I protected them from so much fitna. But today, my son doesn't pray. And he doesn't listen to me. And if I try to tell, tell him something, he gets angry. You know, and he storms out of the house. What should I do? That's not just your problem. That's a problem for Yaqub alayhi salam. A prophet of Allah. A role model father. <laughs> you know? And even he had trouble with children. Why, why is that important to note? Because we are human beings. We don't own Allah's guidance. We don't even own our own children. They are an amana. They are a trust that Allah has given us. We will do everything we can for them, but when they become adults, they will make their own choices. And that is not under our control. We cannot control how they will turn out to be. We can only fulfill our amana to a point, and then they are who they are. This is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even turns to his own daughter. Ya Fatima tu bintu Muhammad. Ittaqillah fa inni la amliku laki min Allahi shay'a. Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, have your own taqwa of Allah. I will have no authority in front of Allah for you. I can't help you on judgment day. You're on your own. This is a fundamental reality that parents must understand. I, 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 my, my girls are now becoming teenagers. And then eventually the boys, I'm more scared of the boys actually, but you know, eventually they'll get there. What happens is when these kids are little, everything about them is under our control. What are they going to eat? What are they going to wear? What school are they going to go to? When are they going to go to sleep? When are they going to wake up? Everything is under our control. But as they get older, you start noticing you're losing more and more control. And they get to a certain point, they become their own person, and now they want to marry who they want to marry. They want to move to a different city for a job. And now the parents are losing control, and they're saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't marry who you want. You can't go to this city. You can't get that job. You can't go to that. You will do what I tell you. Because I changed your di diapers. I fed you when you were little. No, actually, there's a certain age where you have to, parents have to actually let go. They can no longer control. And that's a harsh reality. It's a harsh reality that, that a lot of parents don't accept because it's difficult to accept. But that is a reality. And sometimes our children will not be what we accept, expect, just like Yusuf alayhi brothers. But he tells him, our family is complicated. Just do me a favor. He doesn't badmouth his brothers. He just says, listen, don't tell him. Don't tell them the street. They're not, and, and he doesn't say because they're jealous or they're gonna, he just says, فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا 
I do, I do need you to understand, even as a young boy, be careful of what you say around your brothers, because they, will, they, will, they might make a plan, about, you know, scheme against you. They might make a secret plot against you. Why would you tell a child that? Sometimes children have to be told adult things. <laughs> Our family situations are not always simple. We have to sometimes protect, listen to this carefully, sometimes we have to protect our children from other members of the family. Sometimes there are members of your family that are no good. And we cannot hide that from our kids. You have to know the, the, the elements within your own, nobody knows your family like you do. There are sometimes uncles or cousins or brothers or some other people in your family that are just a bad influence. They are no good. You don't develop hatred for them, but you do protect children from them. You do, I and mean, when you go to a Eid gathering, there's everybody's together, and the kids are running around, and you know some of the bad apples in the family are there at the gathering. You better keep your children where you can see them. They better not be away somewhere, and you don't know where they are. Because a lot of those gatherings, some of the most horrible things happen to our children, and they're exposed to some of the worst things because of their family. I know this not in theory because thousands of people email me about what happens to them and their, with their families. We don't protect our children. We assume they're safe around family. You cannot be so simplistic. That is the teaching of the Qur'an itself. Sometimes there are complicated situations inside a family. And the first people we have to protect are our children. فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا But then he says it's not because these people are evil. But because inna shaytana lil insani mubin. Shaytan has always been an enemy to people, for human beings. In other words, they unfortunately are victims of the waswasa of shaytan. We ask Allah that He protects us from becoming that, you know. And so, in a sense, He says, be careful of the bad apples in the family, but also it doesn't say they're the devil, the devil is the devil. Shaytan is the bad one. Because he leaves the door open. He doesn't say, your brothers, they are so evil, you stay away from them and you never ever talk to them the rest of your life. That's what we do. Because if somebody has been bad, or has had bad behavior, we write them off forever. By the end of the story, you know that the brothers of Yusuf made tawbah, yes? They changed, didn't they? So even if there are bad elements in your family, that doesn't mean that they're shaitan who is condemned to hellfire until the end. They're not like shaitan. They can change. Shaitan's the one that was all, is always going to be an enemy. So there's a clarification by the father to the son. Don't confuse them with shaitan. That's two different things. And so now, I, I, I get to the last part of what I wanted to share with you. As a father, what is he going to give his son? This is my favorite part actually. Validation, acceptance. This boy saw a dream and in one sentence even let his father know that he's figured out the dream. The father first told him to be careful about the complications in the family. And then he tells him, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ That is how your master is, meaning Allah has selected you for the special qualities that you have. Ijtiba is used when a choice is made based on special qualities. So the father is basically saying, son, you've got some special qualities. And those special qualities are so special, Allah Himself has chosen you. And he, this is just the beginning, child. And Allah is going to be teaching you the interpretation of all kinds of speech. Not just dreams. You're going to be a very young, smart young man. You're going to be able to figure all kinds of things out. You have a bright future ahead of you. And then that's not enough. And Allah will complete His, I am confident Allah will fulfill His favor upon you. I even see, I make dua, Allah will turn you into a prophet. Just like He fulfilled His favor, كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ You know, does, uh, actually, كَمَا آلِ يَعْقُوبِ كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْحَاقِ Just like He fulfilled the favor on your grandfather and your great-grandfather, Ibrahim and Ishaq. I pray that you're the next one. Off of one dream, the father gave an entire speech of how awesome you are to this kid. Allah has chosen you, you are so special, you're going to do great things in the future, you're going to figure out all kinds of stuff. Allah is going to make you part of the same legacy as Ishaq and Ibrahim alayhim Allah will fulfill His favor upon you. 
all of these compliment after compliment after compliment. Why? This is a sunnah of prophets that we take the little things that our kids do and we make a big deal out of them and fill them with confidence when they're children. We validate them. Not the other way around. Your child goes, has an exam, gets a 95 on an exam, and you say, next time get 100. I used to get 100 without even taking the exam. <laughs> your, your kids are never good enough for you. They're never good enough for you. You never validate them. This is a horrible thing to do. It's a denial of the prophetic legacy to, to acknowledge the good in your children. He hasn't even interpreted all kinds of speech yet. That's going to happen later. He hasn't even accomplished. He's just a, just a kid. But the father is filling him with confidence that this kid is going to accomplish much. When we instill that kind of confidence into our children, then they will instill that into their children. And in fact, they will accomplish great things. You know, this one thing, by the way, this one kind of confidence that was put into this child at an early age is the same confidence that when Yusuf السلام, was in prison and he came out of prison, he came in front of the king and said, I need to be the treasurer. That takes confidence. He's standing among government officials, you know, people that have been in politics for a long time, economists, and he comes out of a prison cell and says, nobody here is qualified to be the treasurer of this nation, inni hafidhun ameen, I'm the guy for the job. That confidence in the Quran came from where? From when he was a child. He acknowledged Allah's favor on him. He knew what he's capable of. We want that kind of confidence for our kids. That will not come automatically. You know, the opposite is the case. Today, all we do with our children is criticize them. Poke holes at them. Tell them how skinny they are, or how fat they are, or how stupid they are, or how ugly they are, or how not like their older brother they are, comparing them to each other. Constantly, constantly, constantly. And then these young kids grow up. And even when they grow up, what do they do in the ummah? When they see someone, all they can do is criticize them. All we find in this ummah are people that are obsessed with criticism. They cannot see the good in anyone. They can't see the good in the country they live in, the society they live in. They'll say, yeah, our imam is great, alhamdulillah, but... And, then, da, 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 da. and you know where that comes from? Daddy issues. That's where that comes from. Dad used to pick at you all the time and find holes in you, and now you cannot see good in anyone until you find something wrong. Then you get married, and your wife cooks food, and you like the food, and you say, yeah, it's good, but the other time was better. You can't help but criticize all the time, because it was embedded in you as a child. We don't want that to go on. We want an ummah that acknowledges good, an ummah that sees good in people and therefore becomes a grateful nation. And this, by the way, these two things are inherently connected to each other. If you're always finding flaws, then you're never going to be grateful. And if you're never going to be grateful, this ummah will never get out of its mess. Because in shakartum la azidannakum. If you're grateful, then Allah will increase you. Allah will not increase us if we're not grateful. And we, we can't be grateful if we're always poking holes at each other. <laughs> So this thing that I'm sharing with you about fatherhood has major implications. Can you imagine this little conversation? This is what I want to conclude with. This tiny little conversation with this boy. Why is it important? Because a few years from now, millions of people are going to starve to death if not for the confidence of this young man. Because of this young man, thousands of children will be saved from starvation. Because a father did his job. Can you imagine the burden on our shoulders? Do not underestimate the role of the father. Do not underestimate the capabilities of your children. Do not reduce them to, to what Allah Azza wa has chosen this ummah for great things. The, the, the fact that we get honored to be part of this ummah is a great, great noble gift. May Allah Azza wa allow us to be successful parents and to instill in our children beautiful confidence and to make our children really the likes of Yusuf alayhi salam who fulfill the favor that was given in the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. May Allah Azza wa overlook our shortcomings in everything that we do, especially in our role as parents. And may Allah Azza wa give us righteous children that become a source of sadaqa jariya for all of us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Kabir!